Hey y'all, Coach in the Fight here, coming out of the book called The Shepherd of Hermes, his second book, which is called Commands. Now, I'm planning on starting a series where we're going to go through the entire book called Commands, which is, like we said, part of The Shepherd of Hermes. Um, I've been praying a lot on how our Father wants me to do this class. This is our second time going through this series, and in the first times, we spent a lot of time giving introduction on what this book is, The Shepherd of Hermas, um, where it came from, how it used to be part of the Canaan, and then was taken out of the uh, scripture um, by the Catholic Church. Um, but I think I'm just going to save that. I mean, if you've clicked on this video, you obviously know what it is that you are expecting. Um, you probably already understand the importance of these hidden books. You know, I could have went over there to Second Esdras and showed you the scripture on how the hidden books and the lost books would be found in the end times by those who are planning to survive the tribulation. But like I said, you know, you've clicked on this video, you probably already know um, and, and understand the importance of this book. I mean, not only is it important for those who plan to survive the tribulation and go on to uh, be the uh, progenitors going forward after the tribulation and into the kingdom of heaven. But, you know, it's also important for those who plan on going away in um, before the tribulation start, you know, those people who are talking away about flying away in the rapture. Well, it is important to them, too, because one of the first things they'll do, you know, when they enter the spirit world is they will face the judgment. And part of the judgment that they'll face is whether or not they lived right down here on the earth and so that's what it is that we're going to learn by way of these commands is you know how it is that our father expects us to live right i tend to want to give a lot of introductory points um because you know i do understand there's a lot of people who are watching this video who who you know never heard of the shepherd of hermes let me just say this and then i'll try to go forward is that this is the instructions that we were supposed to get in the second era um, the instructions we got in the first era, we are familiar with those. We read those in what's known as the book of the covenant, which is Exodus chapter 20 through 24, verse 7. Those were rules that were passed down, that were given to Moses and passed down for the rest of us to teach us how it is that we were supposed to live our life um, from the time of Moses until the time of Messiah. Um, even going forward, we never were supposed to stop obeying those commandments. But again, they were Exodus chapter 24. It stopped in Exodus chapter 24, but it started in Exodus chapter 20 and went through 24 verse 7. And then after the Messiah came to earth, we entered what's known as the second era. And in that era, we were supposed to get these, well, we actually did get these commands here, um, which we're going to see they're, they're a little bit similar, but they, they are different. It's kind of an, an, an advanced level of commands based on our spiritual evolution or our spiritual maturity. This was the commands that we were supposed to get in the second era. And we would have had them, you know, if it hadn't been for the Catholic Church hid them from us. Oh, you know, but anyway, let me just go on. Um, we're here in the second book. The first book is called Visions. This is the second book. This is the book where Hermes is actually going to get some commands. Um, let's just go ahead. Uh, the introduction. When I had prayed at home and was sat down upon the bed, a certain man came into me with a reverend look in the habit of a shepherd clothed with a white cloak, having his bag upon his back and his staff in his hand and saluted me. Okay. Like I said, I'll, I'll talk more about, you know, the details of this book, you know, as we go. But what you're seeing here is this shepherd that's coming to talk to Hermas. This is where the book gets its name from, the shepherd of Hermas. You have um, Hermas, who the book is written in first person. Hermas is the one who actually wrote the book. But what he's writing is the words that he's getting from this shepherd, this um, individual who is um, in charge of our repentance. Um, he kind of shepherds our father's people who... You know, the father has put it on their heart for repentance and he's coming to Hermes here um, to basically, you know, well, let's just go on. Two says, I returned to salutation and immediately he sat down by me and said unto me, I am sent by that venerable messenger that I should dwell with thee all of the remaining days of thy life. Now. I have been studying this book for over 20 years, almost 25 years ago is when I first read this book. And it is, you know, a lot is a very sophisticated book. It has a lot of details in it. Notice here how I was talking about this venerable messenger here. Um, this, I believe, is the same person we read, read about over in Malachi in chapter 4, in uh, Daniel in chapter uh 
uh, 12, we read about him, I believe, in Ezekiel. This is that angel of the covenant that uh, we hear about that's supposed to come in the end times to help us through the tribulation. Now, notice that this is not the shepherd. The shepherd was sent by this venerable angel. And notice he's saying there that I should dwell with thee all of the remaining days of thy life. So, you know, we're going to you learn about this shepherd as you go through the book. But one thing to keep in mind, you know, as you check out some of, you know, the other classes we've done is that this shepherd, the shepherd of Hermas will actually be with us for the rest of our lives. Verse three says. But I thought that he was come to try me. And I said unto him, who are you? For I know to whom I am committed. He said unto me, Do you not know me? I answered, No. I am, said he, that shepherd to whose care you are delivered. Okay. So now this is the first time that Hermes has met this shepherd. Um, when you go through visions, the book of visions, uh, which is the first part, he was primarily talking to a woman who was the uh, representation of the church. It was only at the end of the book that he starts speaking to a male figure. And he really only asked him, you know, who was that woman you know, that we were talking about? Who was that woman that, that, you know, was talking to me in the book of visions? But here it is that he's actually meeting this individual and he has a different appearance. So Hermes doesn't really recognize who he is. But anyway, verse four says, while he was yet speaking, his shape was changed. And when I knew that it was him to whom I was committed, I was ashamed and a sudden fear came upon me and I was utterly overcome with sadness because I had spoken so foolishly unto him. So, you know, Hermes was, you know, being a little bit harsh with him. And, you know, th this is kind of how it is in our own life, you know. You know, when we are introduced to the Shepherd of Hermas, some of you guys were when somebody started talking to you about the Shepherd of Hermas, you're like, hey, that ain't the word of God. What is that stuff he's talking about over there? The, the word of God. But then as you start to read it and understand it and feel the inspiration that is coming out of this book, then you, you know, you start to feel a little bit ashamed of how you spoke about it, you know, when it was first introduced to it. Verse five. But he said unto me, be not ashamed, but receive strength in thy mind through the the commands which I am about to deliver unto thee. For, said he, I am sent to show unto thee all those things again, which thou hast seen before, but especially such of them as may be of most use unto you or unto thee. Now, he's referring to the book of visions here. Um, the Again, the Shepherd of Hermas is broken down into three parts. In the first part, Hermas is kind of like in a dream state. And he, in this dream or in this vision, he sees the church, the big C church, the original church that was created even before the earth was created. He is there and he's talking to this woman and she shows him a vision of how the church is actually created. Well, then Hermas gets these commands here where he is strengthened to the point where he can actually hear from an angel that we're going to you know hear about and in um this angel that is talking about is the shepherd that's, that's speaking with him because over in the book of similitudes the last book he sees the vision again that he saw in part one he sees it in the last part of similitudes similitudes nine but it is expounded upon and it's broken down with a whole lot more clarity and detail So you have the vision of the church in part one, and you're going to have a similar vision in part three. But understand the importance of these commands that we're going to talk about here in part two, because it is necessary for Hermas to embrace these commands, to hearken unto these commands so that he is able to hear and understand the part going forward. You know, that's why a lot of times I will suggest to people that they read this book more than once. Um, you know, me myself, I've probably read it five times in my life. But, you know, we have to embrace what it is that's talked about in these commands or we won't be able to hear the the lessons or the similitudes or the parables going forward. We won't be able to understand them. So that's what it means by but receive strength in their mind through the commands which I'm about to deliver unto thee. Verse six says, and first of all, write my commands and similitudes. The rest thou shalt so write as I shall show unto thee. But I therefore bid thee, first of all, write my commands and similitudes, that by often reading of them, thou mayest the more easily keep them in memory. Now, I'd have to go in here and understand what these notes are here. I'm going to go ahead and ignore those. They are in brackets, which means that they are definitely added words. And I don't understand what they mean yet. They're not in my hardcover copy of there, so I'm just going to ignore them. 
But what we're hearing here is how the shepherd is telling Hermas to write down the commands and similitudes. Now, we are a version of Hermas. We have to understand that too going forward as we listen to this is that we are Hermas. Every one of us who is listening to and studying this book, it we have to and we have to understand, and we will by the time we get to the end of the end of the book, that we are the Hermas that he is talking to. Now, whether or not he's telling us to write down the commands and similitudes, you know, I haven't done this. I haven't written down the commands and I haven't written down the similitudes either. Those are some pretty long books to be writing down. But I'm wondering if this wasn't specific instructions for the real live Hermes way back then so that we could have a hardcover copy to read ourselves. And maybe the instructions are not that we were to write them, but we have a book for ourselves that we can refer to over and over. Um, this book is found in the lost books of the Bible and the forgotten books of Eden. If you look that up on Google, you'll see it is a volume of books. Again, it's called the lost books of the Bible and the forgotten books of Eden. I have that book on my shelf. It's probably about the fourth or the fifth copy that I've ever gotten because it always falls apart right here in this part of the book. This 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 book of commands, um, the second part of Hermes commands is found almost exactly in the middle of that huge volume of books. And it actually falls apart. I can show you guys. Um, what other books are included on there? Just for grins and giggles. These, I'll scroll through these. These are some of the other titles that you will find in the lost books of the Bible and in the forgotten books of Eden. These are all scriptural texts. Um, the, all of these are the word of God. You know, the, the reason why you don't know about these is or never heard of these books. Like, you know, that book of Adam and Eve right there is really interesting. And there's the Secrets of Enoch. Um, the reason why you haven't heard of these books is because the Catholic Church, the guy I got in Constantine, decided that he didn't want these books in the Bible, you know, and just to give him the benefit of the doubt, I'd say that maybe, you know, he couldn't include all of those books in the Bible because it would have been way too long. You know, we have 66 books already. And if he had included all of the scriptural writings, all of the inspired writings of our father, you know, maybe that Bible would be 600 books long, you know, instead of 66 books. So anyway, all of that to say that, yeah, we need our own personal copy of the Shepherd of Hermas, you know, because we really want to read it often. Um, <laughs> as a side note, you know, when my kids, you know, catch a bad attitude around here, you know, I don't fuss at them too much anymore like I used to. Now, when they get out of line in such a way, I'll actually make them go read this book again, you know. I try not to make it into a punishment, but, you know, it's a way of instructing them, getting them back in line. It's, you know, go read Hermes. You know, it's usually the problem anyway. They've actually forgotten some of the principles that they were supposed to learn over in the Shepherd of Hermes. You know, it's really no need for me to spank them because, you know, they ain't going to learn it by spanking them. But, you know, when they go back and reread what it is that they were missing out of the Shepherd of Hermes, it, it almost always works. It almost always works. But anyway... Let's look at verse seven. It says, whereupon I wrote his commands and similitudes as he bade me. Now, again, this is the commands. It is the book that comes after this. That is the similitudes. It is three parts to the shepherd of Hermas, the part of uh, similitudes. My wife and I, we have already done a verse by verse Bible study on all of the books of uh, similitudes. Um, you know, when somebody asks me about Hermes Academy and they say, yeah, I want to be a part of Hermes Academy. Um, that's what I refer them to is the playlists of the classes that we've done on similitudes. I should put together a full certificate that, you know, they can print out for themselves after they've gone through that class because, you know, it it, it is a, it is a big deal. You know, it is a these books is like I said, this is probably the Shepherd of Hermes is probably the most important book outside of the third testament of the bible that we can be reading in this day and age i know that's a lot to say you know that's including the bible but you know if somebody were to pop up now who you know is unfamiliar with scripture and are trying to understand what it is that they need to know going through to survive the tribulation i believe the first thing i would give them is those four chapters in the exodus and tell them to read through those a couple of times and then i would give them the book called the shepherd of hermas and have them to read that entire book four chapters in the entire bible <laughs> i mean I'm, listen to me i who have been reading the scripture for over 25 years i've read every scriptural document you've ever heard of at least three times and i would literally out of all of the 66 books i would have them to read four chapters out of the book of Exodus, that's Exodus chapter 20, 21, 22, and 23. And then I would tell them to read the entire book called The Shepherd of Hermes. Literally, 
that's 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 that would be my that would that would be my reading list you know and then i would take them over to the third testament of the bible it's that important is what i'm saying that's even why you hear our channel called hermes academy I, we, this whole channel is built around this book literally but anyway verse eight which things if you have heard ye shall observe to do them and shall walk according to them and exercise yourself in them with a pure mind ye shall receive from the lord those things which ye have been promised of them to you see this i mean and think about this for a second you know maybe you can pause it or back it up and listen to that again it's saying you know he's telling him the commands and the similitudes he told him to, to write them down so that he can read them over and over he's saying because if you were to internalize the messages from the books of the commands and the book called similitudes he says then ye shall receive from the Lord those things which he has promised you now like I said I've read the King James Version three times from Genesis to Revelations every word every verse every chapter every book three complete times and I understand all of the promises that are in that book but you see what it's saying here if you want any of those promises out of that book you have got to internalize the message given in the Shepherd of Hermas you know and like I said at the beginning, this book was supposed to be in our Bibles. Now, when you go to it, it was at one point, it was part of the Canaan. You can look this up on Google. It was a part of the Canaan for many, many years until they decided to take this book out of the Canaan. One of those popes decided to take it out of the Canaan. I personally believe that it gave human beings too much power. Look at it. We're receiving these promises, you know, and by taking it, that taking this book out of the Canaan, those promises became alien to us. And now we have to rely more on man for our well-being, for our food, for our clothing, for our shelter. You remember, those are the primary promises of the scripture. You know, seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and all of these things will be added unto you. You know, well, when he took the shepherd of Hermes away, now we don't know how. To seek ye first the kingdom of heaven. Somebody, you know, ask you, what does it mean to seek ye first the kingdom of heaven? What is, what is your answer? What is your response? You have to understand what's being taught over here in these books in order to be able to seek ye first in the first place. And then you will get the promises. That's why I say this book is extremely, extremely important. It is, it is, and it is the only book of the Bible that I've ever read, only book in scripture that I ever read that gave you the instructions to actually teach others. No other book says go out and teach the scripture probably the only one that came close is the book of revelation that said blessed is he who reads and blessed is he who hears this book but it didn't say blessed is he who go read this book to somebody else you know this is the only book we'll, we'll see here later on it'll say actually go teach this book to others teach it to the elect no doubt well let's go on verse 9 says but if having heard them ye shall not repent but shall still go on to add to your sins ye shall be punished by him okay now you know we understand this you know hopefully you guys have read at least the torah you know you should have at least you know read the first five books of the bible and he says this in deuteronomy and in other places that you know what does it say to say blessed is he who keeps these commandments and then he turns right around in the next ver next verses or the next chapter and says cursed is he who don't well that's what this is saying over here is okay you're gonna get the blessings that you were promised if you do keep these things in mind but if you haven't done this you decide that you're going to go on and you know um, be angry. This book is going to talk to us about being angry. It's going to talk to us about lying. It's going to talk to us about, you know, worshiping other gods and stuff. So if we decide after we've heard these, these messages, we're going to go out and ignore them. Well, you know, we're going to still be under the curse that we're under now. We're going to be cursed. It's um, simple as that. I mean, it's simple mathematics. You know, you're going to be blessed if you do it and you, you're going to be cursed if you don't. But anyway, <clears throat> verse 10 says, all these things that Hermes, the angel of repentance, commanded me to write. So now this is the end of this chapter, and he's going to get into uh, the actual commands here. Now, I do plan on making these classes somewhere around 45 minutes to an hour long. Um, so I had planned on covering as many chapters as I could fit in that time frame. So now we're going to go on into chapter one of the book called commands that other chapter over there was called uh the introduction this is actually chapter one and it is the first command you see this note here it says of believing in one god so this command is going to talk to us about believing in one god but notice the difference between this command and what we read over in exodus chapter 20. 
Now, again, Exodus chapter 20 is the first chapter of what we call the book of the covenant or the book of the law you hear people talk about. And it starts out with the Ten Commandments. But now when you get down to verse three, you can see the first of the Ten Commandments. It says, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Do you see the difference between what we read over in the Shepherd of Hermas and what we read here? This one leaves room for those to, un to, to Im at least imply or assume that there are other gods. See how it's saying, thou shalt have no other gods before me. So are there other gods? See how it's written in lowercase letters? Sure, there are other gods. It's, but this one is just saying that we are to put none of them before the most high God, our father in heaven, who created us. So this one is a little bit different. It's saying of believing in one God. Well, let's go on. First of all, believe that there is one God who created and framed all things of nothing into a being. Now. So this eliminates the idea that they could be other legitimate gods. Sure, somebody may have created a figurine somewhere, but that's just a hunk of wood. You know, it ain't it ain't, it ain't got nothing to it other than, you know, that, you know, somebody formed it out of a block of, you know, something like that. But this is and this is stressing that there was only one God <clears throat> who created and framed all things from, you know, nothing into a being. You know, I'm, I'm sitting here and, you know, being reminded of all of the times that I get in trouble. You know, people, you know, talk about how, talk about me believing in a trinity and all of this and all of that. And they'll come and they'll, they'll give a, high, a halfway sideway remark of how, um, you know, wrong for believing in the trinity. And I can't say that I understand them. I've questioned them on it. What are you talking about? What, how, how am I wrong for believing? What am I saying? That, you know, I don't really understand because the way I understand it, you have God. And I know I put somebody choked on the fact that I pronounced that wrong, but this is the overall supreme being, the big G God. This is the most powerful being in the universe. This is, you know, you know, I don't know what else to call him. This is the, the guy who, who, who like the, like the word universe said, he said one word and he created the entire universe. Um, but in him, you have the father you have who, who is, who is like, you know, the daddy of our spirits, but you also have the Holy Spirit, which is his motive force. And you have the son, which is the word of God. You have the word of God, you have the spirit of God and you have the father, but they're all the same. Now, am I wrong for that understanding? These are, I mean, it's no different than when you look at a human being, you know, when you look at a human, you see, or at least, you know, that in the vicinity of that human, there is a body. There is a mind and there is a soul. Well, I see and understand um, the creator to be the same way. He is a father. He is a son or the word and he is a spirit. But anyway, let's talk about it down in the comment section. If I'm wrong about it, you know, it's my, let's, 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 let's debate about it because that's the way I understand it. Anyway, let's go on. I, I, I did a whole class on this part, too. You guys should check it out. You know, it, look up In the Fight, Big Bang, you know, spell In the Fight with no spaces in it. And look at uh, Big Bang there in Google or YouTube. And you'll see a video that we did on, you know, how the father created the earth. What is it? Framed it all from a nothing into a being. Anyway, let's go on. He comprehends all things and is immense, not to be comprehended by any. This, like we said, we're talking about the father, the creator, the, 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 the top being in all of the universe. We can't comprehend that. You know, I, I, I did a um, little research on what it means when they talk about higher dimensions. You heard that we live in the third dimension um, and you, you heard it. You, you understand that um, Adam and Eve were created on the fifth dimension. And it was only after they sinned in the garden where they dropped down from the fifth dimension into the third dimension. And that's pretty easy to understand. but as I was searching and trying to understand these dimensions, you had this individual that was explaining them. And, you know, I was following, you know, until he got up to about the seventh or the eighth dimension, maybe the 10th dimension. But, you know, it was even then when the guy presenting this information, you know, was at a loss. He was like humans. And I agree with him. Humans were incapable of understanding anything higher than the 10th dimension. It's just beyond our scope of Im imagination. We just ain't got nothing to to um, to study on to understand anything past the 10th dimension. But I also understand that our father lives on the 12th dimension. You know, so there's no way we could comprehend who he is at all. 
even when you're reading in the books like uh, Revelation and other places, you know, the only thing that, you know, we can start to understand to, to get an idea of what it looks like is pure light, pure light. But, you know, we read in some places in the scripture that sunlight is even impure to him. So how if sunlight is impure, how pure is the light that's emanating off of him? Like I said, or like Hermes said, or like this shepherd of Hermes said, he cannot be comprehended by any. So let's go on. He says, who can neither be defined by any words nor conceived by the mind? No, we can't. We, we have no way of even trying to figure this being out. Now, he is a male. We do know that. Um, only because we learn in the scripture that the material universe is a female. We are taught that part. But, you know, beyond that, you know, we we can't conceive him. Anyway, I might have just got in trouble saying that. Some people will say, hey, you know, he's a male man. Yeah, because scripture says it. Anyway, let's go on. Therefore, believe in him and fear him and fear in him. Abstain from all evil. Now, I do need feel the need to talk about this word fear here because, you know, a lot of people try to act silly. You know, when they say we're supposed to fear God and, you know, start the little act where they're shivering and acting like they're scared. No, that ain't that ain't that ain't the type of fear that we're talking about. We're talking about the same fear that you have for your daddy. You know, the same fear you have for your granddaddy. You know, you know your granddaddy or your daddy have established a rule. You know, when when you see him coming, you know, you start to think about whether you are adherence to that rule or not. Or if you want to get in trouble or not, you're not running for shelter when your daddy comes in the room, you know. But you are respectful. You are mindful of him. You know, and that's the kind of fear that we have for, you know, the creator. You know, we're not hiding in the bushes from him. But this type of fear causes us to abstain from evil. That's the type of fear that we're talking about. You know, somebody that doesn't fear God doesn't really care about being unrighteous, doesn't care about breaking his rules. You know, and that's what it, and that's why we have this command here that's saying believe in him and fear him because we need to have this healthy fear that will promote us to keep his commandments. Verse five says, keep these things and cast all lust and inequity far from thee and put on righteousness and thou shalt live unto God if thou shalt keep this commandment. Now, we need to be mindful of this part here because we're going to hear it over and over when it says thou shalt live unto God. Um, it, it may be a little too early to try to get a definition of what he's talking about here because he's going to define it a little later. Hermes is going to come out and say, why do you keep saying live unto God? What does that mean? And, you know, he's going to explain to Hermes, you know, in a way that Hermes can understand. But, you know, it all boils down to keeping his commandments. We have to keep the commandment. All of them in order to live unto God, you know, and but this one is 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 talking about um, what was the name of it? Believing only in one God. And it is necessary that we believe in only one God and fear him and, you know, believe in him and abstain from all evil. And uh, what does it say? Um, keep thyself from inequity and far uh, and put on righteousness. Then we can live unto God. So. That was the first command, right? Wasn't so bad, right? We see, you know, it, it is similar to what we read about over there in Exodus, but it is quite different, especially in how it expounded upon it. Now, um, not all of them are going to be that way. Like we see here in chapter two, which is um, the second command, it says that we must avoid detraction and do our own deeds with simplicity. So we this is kind of two commands wrapped up into one chapter here, uh, talking about avoiding detraction and it's talking about charitable deeds. Charitable deeds is really important stuff. And we're going to find out here how it is actually part of the commandments, part of the commands that we were supposed to get in a second era. Now, imagine that, you know, if if humanity had have been taught this from the beginning, that we should have been doing stuff like avoiding detraction and or doing alms deeds, how better off humanity would have been. But, you know, like we said, you know, those those guys down there, Constantine and Justinian and, you know, some of those other uh, um, guys took it upon themselves to remove this information and hide it from us. So, you know, you see, you know, you see the results as humanity. Now, you know, we're all about detraction and who, who cares about doing alms deeds. So let's go down through this one. First one says, he said unto me, be innocent and without disguise. So shalt thou be like an infant who knows no malice, which destroys the life of men. 
which destroys the life of men. This is saying that malice, being malicious towards one another, actually just destroys us. You know, we have to be innocent. Notice it's saying be innocent like an infant. Be innocent like a baby. Don't have any disguise about us. Um, and, you know, we should look these words up. Let me let me look up the word malice here. All right, so we're just going to do a quick Google search for the word malice, and it says the intention or desire to do evil or ill will. So this is, you know, a desire to harm somebody. That's what malice is. And, you know, it's kind of like guile. You know, when you hear over in in um, the book of Revelation, when they're talking about the 144,000, it says that in their mouths were no guile. This is what it's talking about. There's no malicious intent towards the brother. It's one of the traits of the 144,000 is that they will not be malicious. But again, notice how this guileness or this maliciousness destroys the life of man. That's, that's something to think about. You know, there's a lot of sick people in this world. Well, there's a lot of malicious people in this world, too. Verse 2 says, especially see that thou speak evil of none, nor willingly hear anyone speak evil of any. Now, so this is talking about detraction. This is what it means to detract is when we speak evil of somebody, when we're talking negatively about somebody, you know, and it's saying it, don't do it. Even when a person is doing us wrong, even if a person is doing something we think is wrong, you know, whether toward us or anybody else, we shouldn't speak evil about it. We shouldn't actually say this. We shouldn't come out of our mouth talking to somebody else about, you know, about a person speaking evilly about them. And then it says, nor willingly hear anyone speak evil of any, you know, and, you know, once you learn this rule, it gets easier. But I'm going to tell you, at first, it's quite difficult, you know. Especially if we've been around this kind of thing where there are those who will come and slander other people, you know, it, it takes a level of maturity to actually separate ourselves from those people and to, you know, make them stop being slanderous around them, you know, to the point where, you know, we say, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear what you're saying. You know, you, you may not like that guy. So what? That's none of my business. I don't want to hear it. Stop talking about him in that way. Like I said, it's difficult at first, you know, but it gets easier as we go. Verse three says, for if thou observeth not this, thou also who heareth shall be partaker of the sin of him that speaketh evil by believing the slander. And thou also shalt have sin because thou believest him that spoke evil of thy brother. Now, this is some important stuff here because you notice how it's saying that if we listen to a person slandering another individual, if you just listen to him, you're actually a partaker in the evil. You, you actually are committing a sin. You say, well, I didn't open my mouth at all. Mm -hmm. you, you understand what it's saying here? That simply by hearing it, what does it say? If thou observe not this, thou also heareth shall be partaker of the sin of him that speaketh evil. So, you know, somebody comes up and they want to give you the latest gossip, you know, and all of it. And they want to sit there and talk to somebody. You cannot entertain that. You have to stop them. Otherwise, they're going to bring you down with them. Right? And you see what it says there. By believing the slander, so if you've heard what they're saying, so and so did this, so and so did that. If you, you know, you go, if you're hearing it, you chances are you're going to believe it. So you have to block it out. It says, "And thou also shalt have sin, because thou believest him that spoke evil of thy brother." Simply because you believed what you heard has actually put you in a state of sin. So let's go on. Verse four says, "Detraction is a pernicious thing." An inconstant, evil spirit that never continues in peace, but is always in discord. Wherefore, refrain thyself from it, and keep peace evermore with thy brother. Notice here how we're saying that it is an evil spirit. And it was in this book that I actually learned what evil spirits were. You know, they're not necessarily, you know, demons walking around talking about boogity boogity this and boogity boogity that. No, a lot of these evil spirits are things like hatred or a lying spirit. Or unfaithfulness is an evil spirit. And we see here that detraction is an evil spirit. That what makes us want to slander our brother is actually a demon. It's actually, it says right there in the note, a demon. It's a demon. A spirit that never continues in peace, but is always in discord. And like I said a few minutes ago, it takes, uh, it takes a lot of effort to learn to live within this commandment. It takes a lot of effort to start to put away those detractors. You know, people, you know, especially if you've been involved with this kind of stuff, you know, for a while, people see you as a person that doesn't mind listening to gossip. They're going to seek you out, you know, and then you, you're trying to, you know, mature, mature spiritually. So you're trying to put this stuff away from you. Well, when you start to put 
the detraction away when you start to separate yourself from the detractors or you stop letting them slander people around you you notice the level of peace increases in your life and even when some slips in you notice how the peace goes away you kind of notice it and then it kind of dawns on you yeah slandering is a huge part of discord slander is one of the main reasons why we're not at peace with each other it's because we're slandering each other's name and it's and it's not a material thing like somebody has to actually hear you do it no we're we're talking on a spiritual nature so nobody really has to hear you do it at all you can whisper all you want the peace is still going to go away as a result of those actions so we're looking at the word detraction here we can actually get an idea of what it means. You hit the pause button or back it up if you want to read what it says. But this is over here at Google. And then we can see the definition of the word pernicious, which means highly injurious or destructive. Um, and looking up these words is important, you know, because, you know, we may not always know them as well as we think we do. So we want to go in and actually look up the definitions to see exactly what these words mean. But we understand that detraction is a pernicious thing. It's even an evil spirit that takes away the peace and creates only discord. It says, wherefore, refrain thyself from it and keep peace evermore with thy brother. So if you want to have peace with your brother and, and don't think it's a direct relationship just because you're not talking bad about, you know, Albert don't mean that, you know, you know, you're talking bad about Bobby, but you're not talking bad about Albert. Well, you know, all the relationships are going to be, you know, um, in jeopardy because of it it's not going to just affect the one that you're being pernicious towards is what i'm saying but anyway let's go on it says put on an holy constancy in which there is no sins but all is full of joy and do good of thy labors their bracketed phrases makes it a little more difficult to read. All of this is not actually in the hardcover copy of the book. But anyway, we'll work with what we have here. Um, this is basically saying, you know, that we have to put away evil. We have to take on a life full of joy. And we're going to learn that that's one of the things, you know, important to this message that we're hearing is that we're going to have to change our life over from being detractors, from being malicious to actually being joyful and being peaceful. And for some of us, this is actually going to take going to be going to take effort. You know, we see sometimes people in life who have a general uh, peaceful, you know, disposition about them you know always smiling or whatever but there's others of us that have been grouchy for the majority of our life he included you know I, at one point i thought i was supposed to be angry you know i thought i you know was supposed to um be a little bit grouchy or people would take advantage of me and so you know having gone through hermits and learning this stuff i I'll again remind you guys that it's going to take effort but being on the other mm -hmm. side of this thing mm -hmm. i'll be quick to tell you that it is worth the effort you know um life is much better on this side of hermits let me just say it like that Okay, so we're making a bit of a transition here. If you remember up in the beginning that it was kind of two uh, commands in one. One is avoiding detraction and the other one was talking about alms deeds. So now we see we are actually getting a little bit more into the alms deeds part of this thing. In verse 6, it says, Give without distinction to all that are in want, not doubting to whom thou givest. Now, so now we're talking about alms deeds and notice this is a command. We are commanded to give and not just give to who we want, but give to any that is in want, anybody that wants anything from us. We have a command to actually give them without making a distinction, not doubting to whom thou givest. So, you know, what quickly should come to your mind is how, you know, you're walking down the street with you know maybe if two or three other people and there is the homeless guy that's asking for money and then surely out of this surely enough if you've got two or three people around one of them is going to try to you know bring up you know say something like you should get a job or you just he's just going to spend it on liquor or you know something bad no we can't be like that it's not our business why it is that he wants that money we see here and we should try to understand that we are supposed to give it to him even if he even if he is hanging outside of the liquor store you know holding you know one foot inside the door we know that is exactly what he's about to do so what so what that's the point that's what he's saying here give without distinction and i stress this because people have a hard time with this it's like you know we want to judge and say you know that person is not going to do this so he's not going to do that we're saying here let me read it one more time. He says, give without distinction to all that are in want, not doubting to whom thou givest. We can't judge that individual and decide whether he should have 
our charity or not. That's not up for us to decide. It is our father. We want to find out here that our father um, takes the responsibility of deciding whether he was supposed to get that charity or not. Verse 7 says, but give to all for God would have us give to all of all his own gifts. They therefore that receive shall give an account to God, both wherefore they received and for what end. OK, so he's saying that, you know, he is the author of our wealth. If we have anything to give in the first place, it is because he allowed us to have that good thing to give. And. So when it comes to giving, what do you say? But give to all, for God would have us to give to all of his own gifts, his gifts. You know, we're given his gifts. He gave it to us for us to give it. You know, that's why a lot of us get in trouble is because we don't realize that, you know, especially some of the wealthiest of us, you know, think that we have somehow gained this wealth of our own doing. And we don't take into consideration that the father is the author of this wealth and put us in this position where we do have something to give. And so we, you know, get a little bit stingy and act like it's cause of our own doing. Mm -mm. If we have it, it is for the sole purpose of sharing, especially, you know, as we approach this tribulation and apocalypse, you know, if anybody who has anything today is for, you know, uh, is to share, to, to give to others. It says they therefore that receive shall give an account to God. So it's not up to us. We have the responsibility to give it. It's not up to us to decide who gets it and for what reason. It is those that receive that will hope that will be held accountable for what they received. Both wherefore they received and for what end, why they got it and what they did with it. They will be held accountable for why they got it and for what they and, you know, what they actually ended up doing with it. But we're going to learn here in a second, if it don't tell us directly that if we don't give, then we actually get in trouble. Verse eight says, and they that receive without a real need shall give an account for it. But he that gives shall be innocent. And, you know, they will be rewarded for giving. But those individuals, if he didn't have a real need and he, you know, asked for and received something, then, you know, he's going to be in trouble for that what he received. Verse nine says, for he has fulfilled his duty as he received it from God, not making any choice to whom he should give and to whom not. And this service he did with simplicity and to the glory of God. I think it's missing a word there. I may have to go check my hard copy to see what was actually supposed to be there. But I think I'm just going to assume that it was to the glory of our father in heaven. But what it's saying here is that, you know, once you have gave to the person who is in want, you have received, you have fulfilled your duty. Um, you've done what it is that you were supposed to do. You, you received this thing from our father and you've actually shared it with somebody who was in need of it. And so you've done your responsibility. Um, not making any choice to whom you should give or whom to not. So you don't, you don't really matter. You know, you got two people out there standing out there, you know, one lady with her two children and her hand out and one uh, man, you know, with his foot inside the liquor store and he got his hand out, you know, you give to both of them. You don't sit there and decide, you know, if you have to split what you have in half and give, you know, half to one and half of the other, you know, just so you don't make a choice between who's getting what. That's not our responsibility. Here's the last verse in this chapter. Verse 10 says, Keep therefore this command according as I have delivered it unto thee, that thy repentance may be found to be sincere, and that good may come to thy house and have a pure heart. So now these commands are tricky, guys, because they're more spiritual than they are material. Simply by going out and actually doing what these verses are saying, giving without distinction. Now it is that we will have a pure heart. Now our repentance will be found sincere. You start to think, oh, man, how does all of that work? You know, how how am I giving, you know, this guy this or that guy that going to have such a broad effect on so many areas? But, you know, this is scripture. And like I said, I've I've done this stuff and, you know, it all works. You know, we just take it for, you know, take it word for word. That's what it says. That's what's going to happen um, by keeping this commandment. And you remember the other commandment, the other one that we read, um, it said that if we uh, do this, say we should live unto God. That was that one. Um, this one doesn't say that we would live unto God. If we keep this command, it says if we keep this command, then our repentance will be found sincere. So if we want a sincere repentance, we have to give our alms deeds and like I said up there to um, um, avoid detraction. And um, by doing so that we may uh, 
good may come to our house and that we may have a pure heart. So, you know, these are some of the results of our alms deeds giving and our stepping away from detraction and slander. All right. So I believe we're going to go ahead and wrap this up here. Um, the next chapter will be chapter three. It's on avoiding lying and the repentance of Hermes for his dissimulation. We'll look up that word in the next class. But as far as this one goes, I hope you got something out of it. If you did, go ahead and hit the like button. If you didn't, go ahead and hit the dislike button. But leave us a comment either way. And shalom. Oh, and in the meantime, go over and check out our playlist on similitudes.